Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm John Marr from McDougall Interactive. And before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You should see the GoToWebinar attendee interface on your computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. You're listening in using your computer's speaker system by default, but if you'd prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed there. You'll have the opportunity to submit text questions to John McDougall, a presenter, by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collect these and then we'll address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I'd now like to introduce you to our host, the Senior Vice President and Regional Community Business Banking Manager at Middlesex Savings Bank, David Bennett. David. All right, thanks, John, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Middlesex Savings Bank's webinar on 18 steps to build an online strategy for small businesses. Uh, my name is David Bennett from Middlesex Savings Bank, and today I have the pleasure of working with John McDougall of McDougall Interactive to help you learn about the 18 valuable steps to building your online strategy. In addition to step-by-step -step actions for you to implement, John will help you think more strategically when choosing your marketing tactics, positioning yourself as a content expert, and tracking your results. John will present content for approximately 45 minutes and will then be delighted to take any questions you may have. John McDougall is the founder of McDougall Interactive and author of a college textbook on digital marketing. His writing and digital marketing seminars have been featured in the New York Times, the Huffington Post, and Forbes, among others. His award-winning book, Web Marketing on All Cylinders, is an accessible guidebook that explains how to improve your company's bottom line by making your marketing tactics work seamlessly. McDougall Interactive is a full-service internet marketing agency that believes the comprehensive strategic plan is the key to success. Their method is simple. They stay ahead of the social media and SEO curve, so clients' websites are always in the top search engine results and their brands are consistently generating buzz. John and his agency are elite Google partners, having provided internet services full-time since 1995. So I'll turn it back over to John and enjoy the presentation. Thanks, Dave, and welcome, everyone. Today I'm going to be sharing 18 strategies and tactics that I discovered through running hundreds of content marketing projects, and I look forward to hearing what's happening with your marketing at the end. Uh, this is me at Google headquarters on an exercise bike that allows you to have a meeting with six other people while losing weight. Leave it up to the Google engineers to think on their feet. I was like a kid in a candy store every time I visited uh, the Google campus. There are now 4.4 billion searches a day on Google and satisfying those searches takes complex algorithms and advanced paid search targeting. So it's really fun to be around the great minds that invent these programs. I was a media planner at my father's advertising agency in 1994, and this is our first website. In 95, they gave me a laptop and a phone jack and had me drive around to give presentations about the internet and how we could build websites. One guy, upon hearing the sound of the modem, said I was like a modern version of a snake oil salesman and that this internet isn't going anywhere, kid, and kicked me out of his office. We all know how that turned out. As Dave, uh, Dave mentioned, my book, Web Marketing in All Cylinders, is about how to think strategically by seamlessly connecting various digital marketing tactics. It has been a college textbook for four years, and I'm an advisor to various colleges such as Brandeis, North Shore Community College, Endicott College, et cetera, on their cu curriculum. And uh, as, again, as Dave mentioned, I've been featured in, in a number of media. And feel free to connect with me at um, Either you know, email me or give me a buzz if you want to uh, learn more. So what is digital marketing? Digital marketing is SEO, social media, paid ads, email marketing, blogging, online and offline public relations, webinars, getting links from influencers, conversion optimization, and analytics. And who does digital marketing? It's not just done by young people and millennials, but the internet is consumed by more than half of the world, and that is growing steadily. 
Over three billion people are online. When I first started doing internet marketing in 1995, we were like a redheaded stepchild compared to traditional marketers. Today, it's not uncommon for very small and mid-sized businesses to put all of their marketing into the web. Across the board, the trend is in favor of digital marketing in terms of where budgets are going moving forward, as you can see in this chart from cmosurvey.org. So we have a, a quick poll for you, and what we'd like to do uh, is to know roughly what percentage of your 2018 advertising and marketing budget will be spent on digital as opposed to traditional marketing. Zero to 25%, 25 to 50%, 50 to 75%, 75 to 100%, or I don't know. What percentage of your total budget will be spent on things like SEO, content marketing, paid ads, etc.? John, how are we doing with the poll? Well, it looks like uh, we have 24% said I don't know, but uh, then the next uh, biggest uh, section there is 0 to 25%, about 26% uh, uh, of the people who responded said that uh, they're going to spend 0 to 25% on digital. Another 12% said 25 to 50, and 18% uh, said 50 to 75%. Uh, and then we were at 21% uh, said uh, 75 to 100%. So no big uh, outliers there. It looks like there's kind of a, a big mix between people who you know, either don't know uh, how, what percentage uh, they're going to spend on digital marketing in 2018, or you know, it's kind of like kind of even across the board. Okay. And um, so content marketing is blogging, podcasting, videos, ebooks, infographics, photo galleries, and webinars, etc. At the same time, it's also SEO, social media, using paid ads to promote content, email marketing, PR and guest posting, as well as getting links from influencers to your content, conversion optimizing your content, and tracking ROI with analytics. Uh, there are uh, sorry. I'm step back one second. Um, there are many pitfalls on the perilous journey of digital marketing, and uh, it can be very technical at times uh, because at the end of the day, you're relying on servers, website programming, search engine crawlers, or robots, and you may be judged on your ability to handle these things with the most advanced artificial alg uh, intelligence algorithms in the world. Back in the days of the Mad Men, when my father started his advertising agency. Marketing wasn't complicated, uh, was complicated, but it wasn't as dependent on so many technical moving parts. So before you begin your journey, it's important to lay out a roadmap with a strategic plan instead of jumping in blindly based on the hottest trends that you see other people doing. So at number one, document your goals, key performance indicators, and tracking methods. The more specific your goals are and the more you can tie them back to data points and analytics, the more likely you will be able to track progress. One example of a goal would be to get more visitors to your website. Another might be to get people to watch a video, and another to get them to fill out a form for a free consultation or buy a product from your shopping cart. It's critical that you not only map out your goals to what your company's goals are for your digital marketing, but you have the technical capability to track it in some way via analytics. Google Analytics is free and is a good choice for most people. Make sure to understand the concept of setting up goal conversions in Google Analytics and not just installing the tracking code. At number two, you should pick tactics that you feel you can realistically implement with an understanding of what's working for other people. According to Conductor, one of the largest search engine optimization software programs, search engine optimization drives 64% of the traffic to websites. Only 2% is coming from social media and 6% from paid search. Another study by Bright Edge has SEO at over 50% and social media around 5%. Social media is currently is critically important, but it's also important to understand which tactics are responsible for most of the interactions on the internet and what to expect from each tactic. It's also important to optimize for a variety of tactics because that is how you're going to build the 
strongest digital presence. Similar web can give you insights on where your competitors are getting traffic from. It's not a perfect tool, but it's certainly interesting to see. SEMrush recently did a study of ranking factors and they found that brand and user experience are among the top things that affect search engine optimization. So while you might be tempted to only do SEO or social media, building your brand, even from things like TV, radio, and print advertisements can impact your Google ranks, possibly more than merely adding keywords. So at number three, it's critical to understand the relationships between tactics. Once you are aware that your social media activities can greatly enhance the content you create for search engine optimization through blogging and content marketing, you would be hard pressed to just pick one tactic or the other and do them in isolation. If your goal is to get leads quickly, then you should definitely do some paid advertisements such as Google AdWords or Facebook ads. Search engine optimization can take years before you start getting into the top three to five results where 67% of the activity is. And social media is more often about branding, about building your brand and engaging with people than just hard and fast sales. The next step is to develop personas, understand your customer and the pain points they have. If you do not understand your customer and who you're targeting, your marketing won't likely resonate with them and you won't understand where they are spending their time. The things that turn on a CEO, Captain Kirk, and you know, are different from what stimulates engineer Spock. This slide shows the surfing patterns of four distinct types of website users. Breaking out the human race into different persona groupings dates back to Roman times. On the internet, we can use a system like this to understand that there are many different types of people and how to have some content for each grouping. On the top left in the box with the letter A, you can see the pattern of a CEO who may only be looking for high-level social proof by which to make a quick executive but informed decision. Whereas in the B box, you can see an engineer or data-driven personality like Spock. An engineer will visit all the way down to the bottom of your pages and potentially visit every page on your website to gather all of the data to make a comprehensive purchasing decision. For that kind of persona, a clean website with a paragraph and a few bullet points as the entire content on each page will not work. At number five, now it's time to understand the buyer's journey. It would be nice if everybody was surfing the internet and at the final stage of their purchasing process, but that is far from the truth. HubSpot says only about 5% of the internet is at the final stage. So if you do not have content for each of the stages, you will not reach enough visitors. In the awareness stage, you can create research reports and have educational content. In the consideration stage, it's great to have comparison white papers, expert guides, videos, podcasts, and webcasts. While in the decision stage, case studies, vendor comparisons, trial downloads, and live demonstrations can be effective. Now it's important to understand marketing psychology. And this is um, me with Dr. Cialdini in, uh, I think it was uh, PubCon. Uh, one of the uh, top digital marketing conferences. If a lot of people visit your website, it's not per, uh, but it's not persuasive, then you just wasted a huge amount of effort. One of my favorite marketing books is Dr. Cialdini's uh, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. In it, Cialdini talks about the six principles of influence. The principle of authority states that people will follow those that look to be authorities even if they're not of good moral character. Authority and thought leadership has an almost hypnotizing effect on people so use it properly with a healthy mindset and it can be very powerful. Social proof is when people do things because they see other people doing them. The rich get richer so to speak and if your website has a large following on its blog and social media and you have a huge email subscriber list with high quality testimonials, your website will convert better. 
People do business with those they know, like, and trust, and that is essentially what the principle of liking is all about. Reciprocity is when you give something away and then people are more likely to do business with you because they feel some sense of obligation to return the favor. In the case of a website, this could be an ebook or free trial, etc. Scarcity is a common marketing tactic. You might have seen your local oriental rug company do that is, uh, you know, with the perpetually going out of business sales. People want what they can't have, and so if you have a limited stock of a product or you are a consultant with a high hourly rate and a very booked up schedule, you will sell more business. Commitment and consistency is the art of nudging people in the direction of a small action that will lead to a greater action. If people raise their hand to say that they might consider your product or service, they have a somewhat subconscious commitment. If you can get people to take a small action on your website like downloading an ebook or signing up for your email newsletter, you may then be able to convert them more easily. I know a number of top marketing ex experts that don't do any marketing programs without running it first through Cialdini's six principles of influence. At number seven, do competitor analysis and audits. At my digital marketing agency, we have about a dozen important competitive analysis reports that we do for every client, even our programs under $1,000 a month. Here's one of the overview reports that shows the number of pages indexed in Google and you can actually check that by searching Google with an advanced operator called SIT colon, site colon. You just put in SITE colon and then no space and your domain name dot com and hit enter and you'll see how many pages Google understands you have on your website. How many pages their robot has crawled, their spider. And um, so the amount of pages indexed in Google, the number of referring domains or unique backlinks, the marketing grader score from HubSpot, the number of organic keywords driving traffic from Google, the traffic cost if you had to buy those keywords as Google Ads, and if the website is mobile friendly or not. SEMrush is one of my favorite tools for looking at the keywords of your site and your competitors. Here you can see the overview of the amount of keywords driving traffic to a major diamond website. They have over 89,100 keywords driving traffic, which are all like little fish hooks in the water. If they had to buy those in Google AdWords, it would have cost them $4.7 million a month. SEMrush also has a great tool for social media competitive analysis reports. Here you can see the amount of activity engagement on major social networks for various competitors. These are a bunch of news sites and you can see for some reason CNN just has a um, you know, significant amount of, of um, social shares and social activity. And you can see that uh, this tool has audience, activity and engagement. So it's, it's pretty cool once you, once you set it up with your competitors. Ahrefs is my favorite tool for analyzing backlinks. This allows you to see what sites are referring traffic to you versus competitors and you can also run a common backlink report to show the most common links in your industry and then you can go through those and start contacting the websites that don't link to you. So at number eight it's important to build a team of qualified people and document the various marketing tools you will use. Here you can see a list of content marketing tools, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. There are also, there are almost too many technology options for marketing these days, but they're hard to ignore when they make your job easier. I spend thousands of dollars a month for software, but it's all well worth it. If your team members wear too many hats, they may be like a Jack or Jill of all trades, but master of none. We've trained dozens of writers in SEO, that claim they knew how you know how to do it or or the at least the basics of it and hired plenty of young social media experts that knew a lot less than they claimed initially so don't make the mistake of having one person do everything for you in your marketing and really kind of vet out if if um, if people have done exactly what you're looking for them to do not just uh, have heard of it or maybe maybe tried it a little bit and at number nine 
it's also important to build a white hat mindset. If you're interested in getting good results with search engines and social media networks, it's critical not to try and game the system. That worked well for black hats as much as only five years ago, but algorithms have become much more sophisticated at weeding out the crap from the true thought leaders. Following leaders is built into nature. Birds flock and fish school, etc. This little guy decided to lead the charge and others are following. Are you going to do that in your industry? David Ogilvy is a marketing expert that skyrocketed his advertising agency before, uh, after publishing his book. And from Donald Trump to Oprah and many other visible experts of all shapes and sizes, you'll find there are people out there in your industry positioning themselves strongly as thought leaders whether you respect them or not. If you want a solid digital marketing strategy, this activity is at the very foundation of what you need to do. And here's a hashtag. Um, this shows the top social media thought leaders. And what I, what I like about this little chart is that it also shows the page rank or Google score of the website content for these people. Having a strong blog, content marketing strategy, and social media that brings you to the top of the search engines can directly impact the amount of business you get. Google's first patent was actually PageRank, and uh, the idea is fairly simple on the surface. When you look at the large red circle, imagine that is one of the top websites in the world. All kinds of websites are linking to it from small to large. If that one large, high-quality website with lots of links points to another website that doesn't have any authority yet, that smaller site inherits much of the energy from that trusted link. Not only was this the first idea at the foundation of Google, but they were actually initially uh, called Backrub in reference to the way it was designed to check backlinks in order to rank a site for search, re search results. Probably, probably a good thing they changed their name. And you can see here a little bit of page rank code. I don't understand it as expressed in mathematical terms, and that's not critical for you either. What's important is understanding that they are looking for trusted people to put at the top of the search results. They also have early patents relating to authors. This one says that assigning a score to the first agent of the multiple agents wherein the score is based upon the content items with the first agent by the digital signatures. Sounds like total mumble jumbo, but basically you just need to know they are tracking who the authors of blog posts and website pages are in order to judge who deserves to be number one. Here's another patent that looks at fighting web spam and social networks. They have advanced systems to track activities that you would do on social media to see if there is anything suspicious. You don't want to come across like this uh, little Viagra spammer here based upon your fingerprint of website marketing actions. There is also uh, always a guy or a girl in a garage trying to game the system that Google and Facebook have to fight off. What you do want is to have people coming to your site and visiting a lot of pages and not bouncing or pogo sticking back to the search results. Time on site, bounce rate, and number of pages visited are something you should be looking at with Google Analytics to improve your metrics. Google also has a document called the Quality Raiders Guide. It's a handbook for their low-level employees that are systematically judging websites. And they're asked to use an acronym, EAT, which stands for Expertise, Authoritativeness, and Trustworthiness. It's important to make sure that your content is written by experts because Google places a strong emphasis on perceived expertise for determining quality. If you search Google for summaries of the Quality Raiders Guide, like this infographic, you can um, quickly get, get a, a lot more information about um, you know, the various different years they've, they've introduced this guide. And Dwayne Forrester of Bing shared this slide on a webinar I was on some years back that shows how link farms and like farms can be identified. If you buy a bunch of backlinks or likes on Facebook, 
<clears throat> it looks like the blobs on the left, whereas if you organically build your authentic following, it looks like the chart on the right. This is how sophisticated the algorithms of search and social media have become. And Google has developed algorithms like Panda for determining if your content is unique and not a copyright violation, and if your backlinks are authentic through Google Penguin. I have literally seen people cry at conferences that have been greatly penalized and lost their entire businesses in some cases because they gamed the system and in, um, even some of them got caught up unjustly in these algorithms that didn't game the system but occasionally the algorithms make a mistake because they're, you know, they're not perfect. People place a high level of trust and authority in authors. So it's worth it to have a thought leadership mind frame. That is what you're looking for, to be perceived by Google and your customers as the best in your industry, not the one who could cheat their way to the top. Now it's time to pick your content formats. Are you going to be doing blog posts with text, guest blogging, videos, podcasts, resource pages, images, infographics, webinars? interactive content like surveys and quizzes, tools, PR and press releases, and or content creation of various types. There are tons of options and the best content marketing marketers are doing several of them after mastering one really well. Starting with a high quality blog is a great way to, to go and you can add from there. Here's another list of uh, content marketing formats. At number 11, you should create great content and then share it. It's not enough to put content out there. You have to wear it on your sleeve. Content is the fuel for your digital marketing journey and for social media, SEO, links, and public relations. I love how this law firm put um, you know, their blog posts, social media, videos. That's the primary, primary content on their homepage. And HubSpot says that if you have a 236% increase, uh, or you have a 236% increase in leads when you have a website that is over 300 pages. So if you're thinking about just dabbling in this world of search and social media marketing, think again. It's become really much more complex in the last several years. At number 12, promote content more. Most people have a hard enough time committing to blogging even once a month or once a week, but it's going to take promoting that content with greater energy than the creation of it to make this type of marketing work. You can promote content by sending it to your email list, sharing it on social media, syndicating it to other websites, emailing other sites a link to your content, mentioning influencers in your content, submitting it to a content community, connecting with a mentoring group, making it easier to share your content, focusing on the activities that you find get the best results specifically for your audience, and promoting your content with paid ads and remarketing as well as repurposing content. Here's a resource for repurposing content. Lee Auden of Top Rank Blog gave a great talk at HubSpot's inbound mar marketing conference that blew me away. His presentation is at the link below, and it's a great roadmap for taking one type of content that you create and spinning it off into others to reduce the level of effort for content creation. One quick example of this is, uh, here, here's a podcast that I did on my legal marketing blog blog. I interviewed Professor David Wilkins that runs the Harvard Law School Professional Services Division. I then turned the podcast into a blog post with the transcribed text. And one time when I was at Google headquarters, they actually complimented me on the idea of both the podcast and the YouTube videos in blog posts with the transcribed text below it. And they basically stated it's, it's a good thing to have, have our clients be sharing helpful information as opposed to just sales pitches. And um, that text, along with about a dozen more from other interviews, is how I created an ebook as a downloadable offer on, on my site, on that uh, legal marketing uh, niche site. 
And at number 14, avoid content marketing fails. Here's a slide from Rand Fishkin of the SEO software company Moz. He said that people often make the mistake of thinking people will buy from you before they trust you over many visits. Or you vomit up content without a community, invest in content but not its amplification, or you ignore SEO and give up just before it starts working. Many top experts say that it takes a couple of years or more to get a blog established. A blog is at the heart of search engine optimization these days in most cases. That means that hundreds of thousands of people that are frustrated with their search engine optimization campaigns and companies are giving up too soon. Rand's wife Geraldine has a travel blog and you can see the analytics proving that it took over two years to get a spike in traffic. There was basically an inflection point. And he, he, he couldn't sprinkle a little fairy dust on her blog and make it work without her elbow grease and um, you know constant persistence. Now it's time to increase conversions with trust. Remember how I said that Google is looking for authors and experts? Well, here's a cool thing you can do to your team member bio pages. Don't just put up a biography and links to speaking engagements. Um, you know, add links to speaking engagements, publications, social media connections, news, and more. And if you've written a book, you can use that on your site and get featured on other sites because of the book and the credibility that that lends to you. Your book can also get you speaking engagements at associations through associationexecs.com or speakermatch.com, etc. You can also use public relations websites to get media coverage and build authority that way. I prefer PRleads.com for 99 bucks a month, or you can use HelpAReporter.com, better known as Harrow, which is free, but you'll be competing with several hundred thousand users. I did get myself in the New York Times from Harrow, which was which was great. Um, it's just you know it's it's a great site, just just pretty pretty overloaded. Definitely still worth using. At number 16, tracking results and taking action from analytics is a critical part of marketing. Once you install the snippet of code for Google Analytics, you'll start compiling data. Then you can look at how many visitors are coming to your website for organic search, referrals, direct traffic, paid search, and social media, etc. <clears throat> then you can look at the top content that is driving traffic and how that content is performing to drive people deeper into your site and lead to conversions. This particular client has a small wedding planning blog that we created. Her top content is a podcast about open bars versus cash bars. Seeing the analytics, we're now inspired to do videos and infographics about this same topic because we know it resonates with our specific customers. Next, you could look at your About Us and Bio page activity. The About Us page is often the second most visited page on a website, and that's how uh, important it is to display your experts and authorities as well as the mission and personality of your company. Following up fast can make or break your campaigns. A study done based on over 3.5 million leads from over 400 companies show that one minute is the sweet spot for getting back to people. I know that sounds crazy, but the reality is if you don't get back to people within an hour or so, you're really missing out because they have already been contacted by a competitor. After 24 hours, your chance of turning an internet lead into a sale is minimal. We had one customer that was setting aside Tuesday for the salespeople to do the outreach to the leads we got them from the website. Their jaw almost hit the floor when we showed them this study, and they quickly corrected their salespeople and the process of getting back to people more quickly. Finally, at number 18, keep evolving as tactics quickly change. Marketing has come a long way since the days of the Mad Men and three martini lunches. Nothing wrong with martinis, but these days you have to stay sharp and have an organized system of watching trends. 
Feedly is a blog reader you can use to review the latest information from sites like Search Engine Land, Social Media Examiner, Copy Blogger, Quick Sprout, and more. And a common thing that bloggers do is they'll use Feedly and wake up every morning when they're getting ready to blog and start by reading, and the reading inspires the writing. So if you're you know, going to be writing about a topic, look through the headlines of what some of the, the top sites in your niche are, are writing about, read a few articles, and then that will get you started with your next blog post or, or resource page or white paper, etc. So here are a few takeaways. Define your goals and tie them to analytics. Don't blindly pick tactics based on trends. Create 10x level content. Spend more time promoting than creating. Blend in paid with organic in both search and social media marketing. Build your email list and platform. And digital marketing that leverages the relationships between tactics will save you years of pain and help you crush your less strategic competition. Here are some resources that I mentioned, and again, we'll, we'll be sending the, the slides around. And I'm offering a free SEO competitor analysis, so shoot me an email or give me a call or text if you'd like a free report. And all you have to do is give me three to five of your top competitors, and I'll give you reports on some of the most important metrics for digital marketing success. Now I'd like to open it up for questions, and if we go longer than uh, the allotted time, feel free to drop off, and we look forward to connecting with you in the future. Great presentation, John. Um, and Iron, we're not seeing any questions posted quite yet. Um, maybe it's uh, technology on this end. Do you see any? So uh, we have uh, a couple coming in right now. Uh, one person was just wondering, uh, they weren't able to see the slides, so they were wondering if they would get a copy of the presentation. So everybody who is attending uh, the presentation today will get uh, an email, uh, I think by tomorrow, uh, that will have a copy of the slides. Uh, so we will get that to you right away. Uh, also, Robin was asking, uh, do you think that the SEO services that sell their methods to optimize your site are worth the high price? Uh, essentially, SEO companies, I think you're saying, is it worth it? You know, it's funny. I, I actually watched a video yesterday where there was a guy who's more of a PR person or a traditional marketer, and he was saying, you know, SEO companies aren't worth it. And, um, you know, there, there's always there's been a debate since really around the time of Google Penguin, which is 2012, when Google made it so that low-level SEO companies that only relied on black hat techniques wouldn't have good results. And so I think what happened is some people uh, misunderstand or kind of give a bad name to SEO, and they say, "Oh, SEO doesn't work anymore. All that stuff's garbage." And, um, and it was funny, the video I was watching yesterday, the guy said that that stuff doesn't work, and then he said what really works in SEO is content. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, you know, as an SEO that's been doing it 22 years, in 1995 we used to say content is king. So I, I think that you just have to be very careful to understand the difference between you know, you know, the sort of acronyms, you know, SEO, search engine optimization, should really be about great content. And if there's an SEO company that has more of an inbound marketing philosophy, they can, you know, help you write content. They're either they have writers on staff or they're hiring writers that know your specific business. They understand the technical side of it. Um, they understand link building in a positive way because links are actually still very important to Google, maybe less so than in, in previous years, but they're still at the heart of Google. But they have to be good links. So, you know, if you have a black hat SEO company and they're just getting you, you know, on directories or spammy article sites, don't hire them. Their service is not worth it. But to say that, you know, all SEO companies are bad and their services are work it, work, not worth it, absolutely not. It's SEO and content marketing together where you have a lot of strength. And I was just hired by a company where they're already spending $5,500 a month with um, a HubSpot partner, uh, which I also am. 
and that person is doing some really great things. They're writing a lot of case studies, they're doing marketing automation, using a HubSpot, and then at the same time, they don't understand advanced SEO, so they brought me in, and now we're a team. So again, as long as um, you know, you're hiring someone that's going to do content marketing and build your authority, then the SEO service is worth it. Um, and if they're just doing kind of black hat tricks, then it's not. All right, another person asks, uh, how do you determine your top competitors? Well, there's a couple ways to do that. We, um, every client we work with, every prospect we work with, we ask for you know three to five competitors to start with. And it's often the case that the clients um, g give us competitors that aren't the top ranking competitors. Recently, um, it's actually that same company I just mentioned had a particular company, a competitor that they thought is killing them in search, in an in, in organic search. Using software, I was able to show that, actually that's not true at all, they're gaining ground right now, but they're minuscule compared to my client already, you know, where the client's at. So um, you're going to have a sense of your competitors because you run your business, but it's good to have an SEO company or, a co you know, co slash content marketing company use software and searches to figure out who's coming up ahead of you. So, for example, in the law firm marketing space, if you search for, um, you know, um, birth injury attorneys, Boston, Massachusetts, up comes Find Law, which has $27 million a month worth of organic traffic, and then up comes a bunch of local websites. Mixed in with your competitors are some national large people that are actually sites like you. Then there are going to be the large directories like Find Law that's not actually a law firm. They're a law firm, um, you know, mega site. So you really need to think about your competitors in a couple different ways. The ones you think of, you know, as very similar to you, but then you've got to search for your keywords. And then who, whoever's coming up, even if you don't deem them a direct competitor, it's really important to put them into the competitive analysis tools. Uh, and I'll give you one one other example. Uh, also in the legal space, uh, actually this happened twice recently, um, in birth injury and in um, nursing home abuse, we find that there are websites that are not exactly law firms, sponsored by law firms, but sites that are really about that one topic and that have hundreds of pages on that one topic. So while it it may not necessarily be, you know, a law firm. It may even be an association that just has all the pages and information you could ever write about, about birth injury or nursing home abuse. Again, it may not be your direct competitor, but it's really important to have the amount of keywords driving traffic for them, the top pages that drive traffic to them, what content gets linked to that they write, gets shared, and then do what we call swipe files or extract all of the page titles so you can look at the headlines of their blog posts and their top pages. And again, if they're not your competitor but they're a mega site around your topic, you're probably going to find they're more sophisticated than most of your local competitors because they've done you know, much more in-depth work. All right, uh, Stephanie wants to know if there'll also be a recording shared or just a slide. So we are recording this presentation, and you'll get um, a copy of that or a link to that in your in the email as well. And then uh, Jennifer wants to know: Are companies like Hootsuite or tools like Hootsuite uh, affordable for small businesses? Oh yeah, you know there are small business versions of Hootsuite and Buffer. Uh, those are very inexpensive for you know for small business you know for like starting packages. They get more expensive as you. Uh, you know, as you become an agency or you have multiple domains, but yeah, those are those are reasonably uh, priced. And Hootsuite and Buffer are, you know, probably you know two of the more popular uh, basic uh, or you know comprehensive social media management tools. 
All right, Mark uh, wants to know how important is Google Plus? Uh, everyone says that it's the most important thing, like it's the yellow pages of today. I think maybe Mark's referring more to like Google My Business, like the map listings that, that show up in Google. Yeah, so it, in a broad sense, Facebook has kind of won the, the mantle of having the most ownership of a social media network with over 2 billion users. Uh, Google Plus is a, is a, you know, a, a, a great thing that Google did that's a social media network and uh, some SEOs believe that you know if you identify yourself to Google on Google Plus um, you know having a, uh, an account and and you know working on that a bit it, it's a good thing it's not the size of Facebook as a social network but it is actually really good um, what John's referring to is um, Google my business where um, you need to claim your listing for local listings and often you can do that by requesting a postcard and there are some different ways uh, John actually handles that. What are, the, what are the other ways you can claim your listing on Google My Business now, John? It kind of depends, it, it, uh, depending on how much Google trusts that you're the owner of that uh, company. You know, you might have to get a postcard, you might be able to get away with just a phone call. Uh, or in, in some cases, there's some other options that, you know, you're just logging into a different account or something like that that can verify, you know, your listing. But generally, a postcard or a phone yep. call. And I would say that's really critical to many businesses, especially local businesses. You know, if you're uh, a law firm, if you're a plumber, um, you know, banks with multiple branches, you need to own those listings. And we have several clients right now, uh, one law firm in uh, Ohio, where it's the old law firm where he was partnered with someone else. He doesn't like the partner anymore. They canceled the partnership. They don't, <laughs> they're competitors now. And yet you search for this guy's name as a lawyer and up comes the old company name to the, on the right side of Google with the wrong address, the wrong name. And it's really throwing people off and the phone number's wrong. I mean, you just can't really get much worse. And, and the reality is that drives Google local map listing results. It's a big part of uh, coming up in the map listing in Google. It's important to own that account, get a password for it, add, you know, text and, you know, not jam keywords all over the place, but you can fill out the profile completely, add things to it, and then there's other steps to that, like getting uh, map listings, uh, name, address, and phone number, consistently with the exact same way that you put your name, address, and phone number on a lot of local sites. Um, and then those are, and get Google reviews, and all of those things are the traditional things that make Google uh, map listings work. Google, several years back, made it also tied to the main algorithms of Google, such as the acronym EAT for expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. So now, you can't just fill out that pro, you know, that profile, get some local citations and reviews. You also need a solid website with good, good local keyword optimization and quality content, links, authority, and all that, because they don't want that system to be too easy to game. But in the grand scheme of things, if you search for your keywords and map listings are coming up driven by Google My Business, there's no way that can't be but anything but super important to you. Great. Uh, John says, I find it interesting that you didn't highlight video or YouTube as an effective way of one of the better methods to reach people. Uh, Facebook is taking it up on their quarterly analyst calls. Can you comment further on video as an effective tool? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mentioned it briefly in the, you know, the content formats, and it's really important, but you make a great point of emphasizing it and we've been doing that with our clients lately and uh, the statistics are showing that by 2019 uh, it's something oh I think actually one of the slides I may have put uh, by 2019 uh, it, the little text at the bottom um, it said that something like 80 percent of internet traffic through the ISPs or the pipes of the internet there are projections now that um, 80% of web activity is going to be video, which it's almost a ridiculous statement, but this is not coming from some, you know, guy like myself that just loves YouTube and video optimization. It's coming from the people that direct 
the traffic across the pipes. So yeah, I would agree with you, and it's an excellent point. And Facebook, uh, one, uh, some top Facebook experts are saying that basically Facebook's going to be all video by somewhere around 2019 as well. So uh, we're almost stumped by the statistics and the extrapolations that they're doing to say how important video will be. So point well taken. All right, Rich says uh, one of the takeaways that I learned is that we're not promoting as much as doing the, the creation side of content. Can you further expand on ways to boost this, the promotion of content? Yeah, so an easy first way is to use Facebook ads. Um, promoting content is one of the harder things to do at a, at a very deep level. Um, but Facebook ads can get you started quickly. So every blog post that you put out there, spend at least five or 10 bucks on Facebook ads to either boost it or use various methods of Facebook ads to get more eyeballs to it. The, uh, you know, the first most obvious thing people do is, oh, we're gonna share it on our social media. And that's great. Uh, as, as I mentioned in the, in the list of things to promote content, it's important to make it easily shareable. You put the social media icons on your blog and on all the important content, and then you either feed it automatically from your blog into social, your social channels or manually put it up there, and hopefully um, put it up more than once. So um, if you launch a blog post on Twitter, you could put it multiple times that day even, or certainly multiple times over the course of a month. Uh, on Facebook, you know, you can you can certainly put it that day, a week later, maybe a month later, and the same with uh, LinkedIn. You don't want to do as much as you would do on Twitter to like keep pounding it on people, but you don't want to just put your content out there once on your social channels. Put it out multiple times with a schedule, and if you search Google for, uh, if you look at Google Images, there's an awesome graphic that maps this out exactly. Trying to think, uh, I almost put it in. I actually had it as one of the images, and I took it out of the presentation. Um, I'd say I think it's from Buffer, and it's um, you know how often to promote your content on social media networks. And I think probably if you search uh, Google for that, and then look at Google Images, there's a beautiful graphic that shows Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus. Um, for some reason, they don't. They may or may not have LinkedIn in there. And uh, it shows the the, the uh, intervals by which you would do more than just once share your content on social media. So that's one mistake people make is just share it once. Uh, there's a tool, I think it's called Meet Edgar. Meet Edgar is uh, a tool to do what I was just describing if, uh, if you don't use uh, Hootsuite or Buffer to schedule it multiple times. But even doing all of that, the organic reach of social media has been diminished. It's like they have a governor on it, like a go-kart when you're a kid, and it's only going to go like seven miles an hour or whatever they let you do. Um, because early search engines had no ads, and then when they first came out, you know, the first most uh, the first large-scale ad network, Yahoo was running ads, and John was was running those for us the first year, first month that, uh, of of real. Um, active uh, ads and search engines. And now, of course, it's Google's, uh, I think it's like 80% of their revenue comes from their Google ads. Um, so search engines have made billions and billions of dollars because they've monetized. Social media now is monetizing, and they kind of don't want you, I, I don't know if, if I'm saying it's the best way, but they kind of don't want you to succeed organically 100%. They want to make it so that you have to buy ads as well. Um, so they're going to kind of limit what organic can do so that you also do paid ads. So, you know, I, you kind of can't fight that in a way. I mean, you, you could, but um, we believe that it's a good idea to, um, to do both, to be more aggressive with your organic content sharing and also use paid content um, promotion whether it's Twitter ads, uh, Facebook ads being the biggest, LinkedIn ads being highly specific. And then lastly, um, one little advanced tip, you can, um, you can find, like say you create an amazing piece of content, like the ultimate guide to 
um, I don't know, chiro, you know, ch chiropractic services for back pain or something. Um, if you find other p other websites popping up in Google, and you can use a tool for this, uh, either Ahrefs or SEO Quake. They have these Chrome browser toolbars, and when you search for your keywords, uh, that you know, if you have an awesome piece of content, you search for the you know what that topic is, and it'll show you the best pieces of content ranking in Google and how many people link to them. Then you can go get the the people, the websites that link to them using Ahrefs. You can figure out all the sites that point to other similar pieces of content. Go figure out what. Uh, you know who you could email on that site and send them an email and say hey I, I see you linked to this awesome infographic about back pain we have an amazing video about back pain you might like to link to this as well and you know you, you do the outreach so those are just a few of the ways it's a it's a complex uh, mechanism to do that stuff um, last little quick one mention influencers so if you're writing a blog post don't just write only from your perspective. Say, hey, and by the way, you know, the Association of Chiropractors says 82% of back pain is caused by, you know, listening to webinars <laughs> um, or whatever it is. So um, if you quote other experts, then you can reach out to them and say, hey, we quoted you in this article. You might like to share it with your, your audience. And they may be more likely to share it because they're a part of it. So those are a few promotion techniques. All right, it's uh, just about the top of the hour now, but we only have a few more questions left, so we can yeah. stick around and, and answer a few more. Answer, Angela just wants to know what uh, HubSpot is. So HubSpot is kind of an all-in-one internet marketing tool, or they call it inbound marketing. Um, it's like a Swiss Army knife kind of tool. So you can schedule social media, you can do email marketing, you can do marketing automation, which a lot of other tools do not have. So it's maybe one of the most essential features that you can't get as easily from you know all these other types of tools I mentioned so basically marketing automation lets you set up a workflow if somebody downloads an ebook from your website HubSpot will let you say okay send an email saying thank you and offer another resource a day later say or you know maybe a few days later we see that you download the ebook about back pain you might also like the a webinar about back pain as well. So HubSpot has uh, tools to help you pick keywords, to do blogging. They even have a whole platform, um, the COS, uh, the like a like a WordPress kind of thing, where they allow you to build websites and even personalize the content. So it's a lot of search engine optimization, social media marketing tools, web design tools, email marketing tools, all kind of wrapped up in one. And it's, it's really powerful, has awesome analytics, lets you see if someone fills out a form on your website, when they come back to your site, you can see the name of the person. Hey, Joe Smith is back on your website, and he downloaded this ebook before, and now he's visited your pricing page. You might want to, you know, wait a few minutes and email him and say, hey, you know, I see, uh, you know, I haven't talked to you in a while, you know, maybe we can... We can get together or something like that. So it gives you some amazing information you don't get from Google Analytics or some of these other tools. And Deb wants to know, do you feel that PR firms are valuable today to get your message out through publications, or is this something that you can do more on your own through content on blogs, et cetera, and then having it get picked up? That depends on your budget. You know, if someone gave me three or $5,000 a month more just to hire a PR firm, I'd probably do it, um, but you know it, it it can be very costly, and sometimes even at three or five grand a month, maybe they're not even getting you that much. Uh, depends on the PR firm, um, but getting featured in whether it's HubSpot or you know the Association of Back Pain Experts or you know industry magazines. Water, wastewater magazine. If you're in water filtration or something like that, um, or certainly the New York Times, etc. The more you get featured in the media, the more you build up your authority. And if those sites link to you, now you have a, a signal to send to Google that you're more powerful than just a website that may have a lot of keywords. You may have a lot of blog content. But if other sites aren't linking to you and featuring you, 
you're not that valuable. So PR is actually essential, uh, but it can be really expensive, as can link building be expensive, uh, getting other sites to feature you. So uh, again, PRleads.com, for 100 bucks a month, I every single day I get probably 10 or so emails a day. I, n I generally never miss looking at one of them. I, I just glance at them and I see, and I have it broken but by filters for different clients. So banks, uh, law firms, e-commerce, different types of trends. And um, you know, then I, I forward them off to my client or for certain clients we do that ourselves and just send, you know, whatever the journalist is looking for, they might say, hey, I'm looking for an expert to give me three tips about back pain. And then you just email them back really quick because someone else is going to get in there before you and you give them th your three best tips. Hey, I'm John McDougall. I'm a chiropractor and, um, you know, I've been featured in the New York Times and uh, Back Pain Magazine doc already and here are three tips. Or they might say, I want to, you know, call you, call experts and interview you, etc. But you can have a pretty high success rate on your own for really short money, either free with a tool like Harrow or uh, you can speed it up massively with a hundred bucks a month for um, you know PR leads. All right, just a couple more. Jill says, shouldn't every online strategy begin with the preferences and habits of your target audience? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I spoke just briefly on that about um, understanding the pain points of your customers, the personas, their uh, stages of the buyer's journey, so the awareness, consideration, and decision stage you really should map out as much as possible. You know, look at your competitors, what they're doing, map out your personas, map out the buyer's journey stages, then map out, you know, what content you're going to create at each stage, how it's going to address the pain points of your customers. That's an excellent point. You know, and I think, um, well, I should say, I, I did a blogging course with John Morrow of, uh, at the time it was Boost Blog Traffic, now it's Smart Blogger one of the top bloggers in the world and he said you know try and write about what keeps your clients or your you know your your audience up at night their top pain points if something's a nightmare for people and you're blogging about it and really covering it it's going to resonate with them so absolutely all right final question from joe you mentioned promoting content for uh, b2c companies with things like facebook what about b2b promotion of your content yeah, so um, if I think the tactic that I was sharing, uh, well, for for one, using Facebook ads and targeting, um, you know, the right types of audience uh, through the to the demographic targeting tools you can use in Facebook ads or LinkedIn ads. Um, you know, like like LinkedIn ads, you could go and you could sort and filter by only water filtration companies. And this, you know, say you're looking for the marketing directors of uh, water filtration companies, you can uh, outreach to them th using LinkedIn um, by figuring out, you know, all the a water filtration companies, b a certain uh, job description at them, either just through LinkedIn uh, advanced searches or I like um, LinkedIn Sales Navigator. It's a tool for like, you know, a little less than a hundred bucks a month. You can uh, be, you know, you set up, uh, it's called account-based marketing. So I think IBM coined the term a ways back. So you would set up like a hundred or 500 companies using advanced filtering. Okay, we're going to have 500 companies that all they do is, you know, uh, water, fil something to do with water filtration. And then we're looking for the purchasing agents. And then you, um, you you designate those as um, you know contacts in in this tool, and then it's going to feed you information about those people. Are they featured in the news? Is the company moving offices or something like that? And then you can reach out to them and uh, in, engage with them. Um, but it, also, I think it doesn't matter whether you're a B two C or B two B. If you want to promote, say you have an infographic about, uh, let's think of a business to business thing. Um, again, uh, it, it, water filtration at the level of like a Coke membrane systems. Um, you know, if you're looking for to build a water treatment facility for um, 
Coca-Cola, Pepsi, or you know Schweppes, different uh, companies that are um, you know building plants or uh, oil and gas companies in the desert. If you want to reach out to them, if you create an amazing piece of content for them, like an infographic or a guide or say a white paper, and if you again search Google for you know white papers about um, you know water treatment, and then use the tool Ahrefs, the link building tool, to figure out who is linking to your competitors' B two B level content. And you're probably going to find in those backlinks wastewater magazine or whatever, right? Water Association news. You're going to find sites linking to this content that are relevant to you in the B2B space. But you have to do that forensic uh, analysis of, of who um, is doing the linking and sharing in order to do the outreach to them. So again, whether it's uh, SEMrush or Ahrefs, those are great tools to, to dig up that data to promote your B2B content. We did have one final question just come in from Rich. Uh, how do you make recommendations on a marketing budget for small companies? And this will be the last question. Yeah, so um, if you look at whatever your budget is, if you look at that tool that uh, the slide that Conductor did, I find it fairly interesting uh, that, you know, if your goal is website traffic, SEO tends to drive more than 50% of traffic to websites, whereas social media a lot less so. Um, and then um, paid search and direct traffic, you, know, you can kind of get a, a little bit of a window into what tactics are effective for driving traffic. And then you might want to think about breaking your budget out based on something like that because it, you know, it kind of shows a little bit of where the most effective things are to drive traffic. But you may have a different um, goal. You know, if your goal is largely not um, website traffic, but when people get to your website to you know, build trust and authority, you would have a different uh, you, you know, uh, type of goal. So some of it should come from data and statistics. There are some companies like eConsultancy that often publish data, uh, Comscore, uh, eConsultancy, and one thing I like to do is look in, again, in Google Images and look up small business marketing budgets and the percent of spend, and there are some amazing um, breakouts of where people are putting their budgets by tactic. Um, so I would check some of those out, and then, um, you know, some of those graphics and, and studies will also show you know how much people are putting into traditional versus digital like that that slide I shared all right that's our final question uh, David you want to take us out yeah well thanks gentlemen thanks for staying later we had a lot of good questions uh, over a half hour worth of questions so that was fantastic um, uh, after you leave the webinar everybody you will receive a short survey and would greatly appreciate it um, if you take a few moments to complete the survey and provide us with your thoughts Big thank you to John for his insightful, helpful, and valuable presentation. And we here at the bank hope you found the webinar useful for your business. So keep your eye out for future webinars and hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.